Near the north border of Arizona rests the Grand Canyon, a natural rock formation that is 10 miles wide, one mile deep, and 277 miles long. If you've only ever seen the Grand Canyon in pictures, then it might be hard to grasp the sheer size of this enormous formation. Running through the depths of the canyon is the Colorado River, a large river that has become a sort of tourist destination for many. The Grand Canyon National Park sees hundreds of thousands of guests every year that come to marvel at this beauty of this impressive feat of nature. However, even though the Grand Canyon has become a popular spot for families to come and see, we must always remember that the canyon can be a dangerous place for the unsuspecting traveler. The Grand Canyon is absolutely massive. It is estimated to be larger than the entire state of Rhode Island, and it is thought that the canyon took six million years to form. It is home to more than 1,000 caves, and there are many sources that claim the number of caves is actually much larger than we think. Although the Grand Canyon has been a popular destination since people began living in northern Arizona, there is still so much about it that has not been discovered. We will never truly know the full extent of the mysteries of the Grand Canyon. Some of the first inhabitants of the canyon were the people of the Anasazi native tribe. It is thought that this tribe lived in the canyon since around 1250 BC. The tribe lived there for years, building structures on the side of the canyon and using the naturally forming caves as shelter during the colder months of the year. Then, the tribe just left. Many historians theorize that only a great cataclysm could have forced the indigenous people out of their well-established home. It is thought that there may have been a great drought that dried up the river and forced the tribe to find sustenance elsewhere. Others theorize that something a little more strange forced the tribe out. Either way, it is accurate to say that the disappearance of the tribe would be the first disappearance in the Grand Canyon, but it would certainly not be the last. There have been many people who have gone missing in the canyon. As I said, the canyon is huge and if an unprepared visitor gets lost or stuck somewhere, it can be nearly impossible to find them, especially if they're traveling off the main paths. The canyon is made up of a complex system of caves and trails. If someone strays too far away from a well-established route through the canyon, it can be very hard for them to find their way back to civilization. Today, we will examine a number of cases of people who've gone missing in the Grand Canyon. Almost all of these cases are still unsolved, and we still may not have the answers as to what fate each of these people met. Join me as we dive deep into the many missing person cases of the Grand Canyon. In the summer of 2016, Floyd Roberts III and his friend Ned Bryant went for a hike in the Grand Canyon. They were accompanied by Ned's daughter, Madeline, and they all had a decent amount of experience and familiarity within the canyon. Floyd, who was an ex-NASA employee and computer programming teacher, he was an experienced hiker and had hiked many times in the Grand Canyon with no issue. He saw this as an opportunity to show his friend and his friend's daughter around a few trails that he had discovered while doing some solo hiking. The group planned to do a nine-day backpacking trip, camping every night, and enjoying the sights and sounds of the breathtaking Arizona wildlife. Just a few days into their trip, they came across a large hill. The group had run into no problems during their time in the Grand Canyon, and the trip was going smooth as it possibly could. When the group had reached this hill, they decided to split up. Ned and his daughter would hike over the hill, and Floyd would hike around it. They had split up before during this trip, and they didn't see an issue with the plan that they had formulated. After deciding on a meeting place that Floyd had scouted out a few weeks beforehand, the group took to their separate trails. Ned and his daughter faced the daunting task of climbing up the large hill. It was a scalding Arizona day, and the hill left them both tired and thirsty. When they made it to the top of the hill, they took a quick break to catch their breath and rehydrate, not wanting to keep Floyd waiting. The two headed down the hill and made quick work of the downward incline. When Ned and his daughter made it to the meeting place that they had decided on with Floyd, they noticed that they had beaten him back. While a little strange, they didn't think much of it. Surely, going around the large hill would take a considerable amount of time, and maybe Floyd had gotten tired. After all, it was a particularly brutal day. The pair waited for Floyd until the next 10 minutes. No sign of their friend. They waited for another half hour. Still no sign. Ned was getting worried now. He knew that Floyd should have made it to them by now. 
Since the hill had multiple possible paths around it, the two didn't even know where to start looking for their friend. They decided to continue their hike until they reached an area that had cell reception. Then, they would call Floyd and discover where he had gone. After deciding on their plan, Ned still felt something wrong about abandoning his friend. He decided to backtrack and look for Floyd himself. It might cost him a day of traveling, but he would feel much better if he knew his friend was safe. Maybe Floyd had tripped and knocked himself out on a rock. Maybe he ran into a rattlesnake and was bitten. As the two searched for their friend, the hours went on. They could find no trace of Floyd. After camping the night near the hill where their friend had gone missing, the two decided to go with their original plan of going, getting cell service and trying to call Floyd. When they reached an area of the canyon where they could call him, Floyd did not answer. Now, fearing the worst, Ned called the National Park Rangers and reported Floyd as missing. Over the next few days, helicopters, dogs, and several ground teams of experienced rangers would search an area of 10 square miles to find Floyd. Nothing ever turned up, and strangely, they couldn't even find any trace that he had been in the area. The most they could find were footprints, but they could not verify that they even belonged to Floyd. Floyd Roberts III is still missing to this day. If you have any information regarding what may have happened to him, please reach out to the park rangers of the Grand Canyon so his family can find some closure about his whereabouts. This next case is particularly chilling. In October of 1928, a newlywed couple, Glenn and Bessie Hyde, decided to set off on an adventure down the Colorado River at the base of the Grand Canyon. They set off in their boat with a large amount of supplies and traveled downstream for a week or so and stopped at the Grand Canyon village to refill their supplies. They were last seen on November 18th. A few weeks after that, their boat was found. Usually, when a boat of a missing party is found, it is smashed and damaged and there are clear signs of capsizing. The boat that the Hyde family had been traveling in was found in near pristine condition. The couple was soon declared missing and there were no trace of them in the canyon. This story, however, does not end with a simple missing persons report. The actual truth of what happened was much stranger. While we do not know much about the newlywed couple, there were witnesses that had seen them traveling down the river. They all claimed that Bessie looked upset like she didn't want to be in the Grand Canyon. They could feel a tension between him and his wife that made people uncomfortable. While we cannot accurately determine the state of the couple's relationship, this perceived tension would prove to be a crucial part to their story. The story of Glenn and Bessie Hyde would make its way around the campfires of the campers in the Grand Canyon. They soon became a legend and many people speculated as to what really happened on their boat trip people began theorizing that Bessie had killed Glenn or had sabotaged their trip so the two would die out there together. Neither of their bodies were found over the next several years, so the imaginations of the travelers in the Grand Canyon ran wild. It would take another few years before anyone discovered what had really happened to the newly married couple. Several years after Glenn and Bessie went missing, another group took a boat trip down the same route that they had years earlier. By this time, the Grand Canyon was safer for travelers, and many people had some level of expertise regarding boating down the Colorado River. And a few days into the trip, the group ran into a woman traveling alone, knowing the canyon to be a little unsafe for solo travelers. The group invited the woman to join them on their journey. She agreed, and the party continued their voyage down the river. The woman they picked up identified herself as Georgie Clark and she proved to be a valuable addition to the group. They traveled together for another few weeks, and the trip was without incident. Georgie was a great help to the travelers, given that she knew the canyon so well. They all greatly appreciated her help with navigating some of the rougher sections of the Colorado River. Even though Georgie was a welcome addition to the group, there was something strange about her. She claimed that she had been living on her own for a few years now, camping every night and surviving by fishing and foraging for food. While the group had come across many people from the Grand Canyon Village, Georgie seemed to be an outsider in the canyon. The group kept a close eye on the stranger as they continued to travel down the river. As the days went by, they warmed up to Georgie's presence and she became just another part of the group. Everything would go smoothly for the next few weeks. The story of Bessie and Glenn Hyde had become a sort of legend at this point. People that traveled through the canyon often told stories about what had happened to the couple after they went missing. Many people thought that Glenn had killed Bessie, or the two had decided to abandon their worldly possessions and live out in nature. 
Stories pass themselves down from group to group like ghost stories around a campfire, and the legend of the Hyde couple grew to be a staple in the life in the Grand Canyon. The voyagers that picked up Georgie Clark were very familiar with this story and had often tried to scare each other, claiming that they had heard the wails of the couple's ghost during the night. All of these stories were told in good fun, and many people had stopped wondering or caring about what happened to Glenn and Bessie Hyde. One night, when the group was gathered around the campfire, Georgie made a shocking statement. She claimed that she was actually Bessie Hyde and that she had killed her husband so she could start a new life. Georgie said that she had lived in solitude for the past few years and was now ready to rejoin society, so she followed the group and planned to join them. The group didn't know what to think at that time. They had picked up this woman and she certainly was strange, but the story of Bessie and Glenn Hyde was well known and they knew that Georgie could simply just be making this up to scare them. They brushed off her remarks and continued to travel with her, eventually completing their journey. The journey of this particular group would end without incident. After they finished their trip, they headed for the nearby towns and went back to their normal lives. Georgie would also settle herself in a nearby town and stay there until she passed away many years later. The town knew her as a strange but good woman who was friendly to those around her. She never again claimed that she was Bessie Hyde and lived the rest of her life as Georgie Clark. The people of town didn't think anything of it when she passed away and the town mourned her death. After Georgie's death, the police would examine her belongings to see if they could glean any useful information off them. In her belongings, they found a birth certificate that identified her as Bessie de Ross and a marriage certificate for Glenn and Bessie Hyde. It seems that Georgie, or rather Bessie, was telling the truth. She had killed her husband and started a new life in the Grand Canyon. This shocking tale had been the source of speculation for many of the missing persons cases in the Grand Canyon. While it can often seem like someone just wandered off and was never found, maybe there's something more sinister to quite a few of these missing person cases in the Grand Canyon. Glenn Hyde's body was never found, so we do not know how Bessie ended up killing him. It is thought that she was never too happy with the marriage and wanted to start a new life on her own. I mean, she could have easily pushed Glenn into the river as the two sailed along and went on with their life, claiming that it was an accident, of course. She had no need to change her name and go through all the hassle of pretending to be a different person. We will almost certainly never know the details of what happened between Bessie and Glenn, but the mystery of the case still captures the minds of many researchers of the unexplained mysteries of the Grand Canyon. This next missing persons case, unfortunately, follows along the same lines of Glenn and Bessie Hyde. Robert and Donna Spangler headed to the Grand Canyon in 1993 to do some sightseeing. They had already been there for a few hours, taking in the breathtaking scenery and enjoying the day together when disaster had struck. Donna had slipped and fallen to her death. Robert claimed that they were both near the rim of the canyon when he looked away for just a moment. When Robert looked back, his wife was gone. He claimed that she had gone off to get a closer look at the edge of the canyon and theorized that she had slipped and fell to her death. Donna's body was recovered some 200 feet below the rim of the canyon. She was declared dead on impact, and it seemed as though this was all just an unfortunate accident. Robert would return to his home alone and tell the police all of the information he had. The police officers took his statement and filed the report. Donna's death was ruled as an accident and the case seemed to be open and shut. Many people, though, had suffered similar fates and the police had seen this kind of thing from time to time. Robert would carry on with his life, becoming detached from both his family and Donna's family. He just wanted to be left alone while he dealt with the unfortunate circumstances of his wife's death. After a while, he started going out again and appeared to be back to normal self. He had gone through his grieving process and was ready to put the whole horrifying incident behind him. Not everybody was so convinced that what happened to Donna had been an accident, however. Donna's relatives were not huge fans of Robert and they suspected that something else had gone down on that tragic day. They noted that Donna was terrified of heights and would have likely never gotten near the rim of the Grand Canyon. So the family had started to speculate that Robert had grown tired of the relationship and pushed Donna off in an act of malice. The police chose not to look deeper into the situation. They had seen many unfortunate instances of people falling to their deaths in the Grand Canyon and ruled the incident as a tragic accident. 
for several years, that would be all there was to the story. The law enforcement officials over the Spangler case would not remain without their suspicions, however. Robert seemed to have a tragic past that hinted to something sinister inside of him. Robert's first wife and two kids had been killed 20 years prior, and police were getting suspicious that he may have been behind all of the tragic losses in his life. The police chose not to question Robert further, however. They knew that they didn't have any concrete evidence to possibly suggest foul play in either cases. They didn't want to bring up past trauma if Robert was truly innocent. They chose to wait patiently and look for an opportunity to question Robert about the mysterious circumstances of his wife's death. They waited seven years before they got another word out of Robert. Robert had been diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, as well as brain cancer. The authorities knew he did not have much time left to live, and they suspected that he would be more than willing to talk, knowing that he was almost gone. They approached Robert and asked him to come in for more questioning regarding Donna's death. Robert agreed and came down to the station. His confession would unearth years of vile acts that remained unknown until then. Robert admitted that he had pushed Donna off the side of the Grand Canyon. He stated that he was simply unhappy in his marriage and he didn't know of or any other way to solve his problem. Robert chose to kill an innocent woman instead of facing his problems head on. This would not be the only instance of Robert committing murder, however. As suspected, Robert admitted to killing his first wife as well. He said that he wanted to be with another woman and wanted to get out of his marriage. Robert killed his first wife and their two teenage children. Robert would go on to marry his next girlfriend. They were only married for a few years before they were divorced, and Robert's next marriage after that would be Donna. Robert Spangler was sentenced to life in prison and is expected to die soon of his cancer. This man was a monster who chose to kill instead of facing his issues. Cases like these are unfortunately common when it comes to the Grand Canyon, and every case of suicide or accidentally falling into the canyon is now thoroughly investigated in order to avoid another situation similar to what happened here with Robert and Donna Spangler. Our next example of a disappearance in the Grand Canyon was the case of a 22-year-old man named Morgan Heimer. Morgan was an experienced guide for hiking trips in the Grand Canyon. He was confident in his abilities to lead groups of hikers to the area, and he knew his way around the trails and hiked on a regular basis. Morgan had lucked out with the summer job of his dreams. He was always drawn to the outdoors and was honored to be getting paid to lead people through the beautiful canyon that he knew so well. To Morgan, the Grand Canyon was his home and there was nowhere else he would rather be. During the first week of June in the year of 2015, Morgan was leading a tour group on a six-day expedition to the canyon. The trip had gone fairly smoothly. Some of the people in the group were not as well prepared as Morgan and thought they should be for a multi-day hiking trip in the heat of the Arizona sun. But Morgan was good at his job and he knew he could leave the group safely through the canyon with no incident. Well, about halfway through the trip, the group had made their way to the banks of the Colorado River. Morgan always encouraged the groups he escorted through the canyon to swim in one of the calmer sections of the river. He had scouted out this specific section of the river and knew that the water was perfectly suitable for anybody to swim in. While the group was playing around in the water, Morgan stayed on the banks of the river. He was constantly having to answer questions from several members of the group and he was happy to do so. A few of the group members were talking to Morgan and asking about the plants around them. A couple of them had questions about how long the trip would take them to complete and Morgan patiently answered all of their questions one by one and made sure that each person was satisfied with the answer that they got. When the group finished, they began walking away from Morgan and back towards the rest of the group. Remembering that he had forgotten to ask the guide about something one of the group members turned to ask Morgan another question. He was gone. The group began to look around for Morgan. They knew that he had to be close by. I mean, he had been monitoring where the river picked up in speed in order to make sure that nobody traveled too far downstream. One of the group members simply suggested that Morgan left to go on a walk. He had been answering questions all day and maybe he was a little worn out from social interaction. As the hours marched on, the tour guide was nowhere to be seen. The group now began to fear that Morgan had fallen in and was swept away from the river. Several members of the group began to fan out to find their lost guide. They searched for hours but could not find any trace of him. The group decided to backtrack and climb out of the canyon. 
the way they had come down. They didn't have a guide and were not confident in their ability to navigate the trail without help. When the group emerged from the canyon, they immediately flagged down a park ranger and reported the missing tour guide. Fearing the worst, the ranger called in a search team and they scoured the area for days. The only sign they found of Morgan was his boots floating in the river. To this day, Morgan Heimer is still missing, and those that know Morgan are confident he would be able to navigate the river with confidence. The area that the group was swimming in was known to be a calm part of the Colorado River, and Morgan knew how to get himself out of a sticky situation. Although it has been several years since Morgan went missing, park rangers are still unable to find any trace of what really happened to Morgan Heimer. The last missing persons case that we will discuss started in March of 2016. Diana Zacharias, a 22-year-old woman from Louisiana, set out on an adventure of a lifetime. She was going to hike the Grand Canyon from rim to rim by herself. She had spent months researching the trip and her parents even supported her decision to face the adventure by herself. They were nervous, but when she left, they thought their daughter was capable and they knew that there were many helpful people at the Grand Canyon that could guide and help her if she ran into any trouble. From the start of her adventure, it seemed as though everything was telling her to turn back. When she got to her plane to fly from Louisiana to Arizona, she was forced to return to the airport due to a mechanical failure with the plane. Still, determined to make it to Arizona for her adventure of a lifetime, she had her father drive her to another airport in a nearby city just so she can make it in time for her planned trip to the Grand Canyon. When Deanna's father dropped her off at the second airport, he had no idea it would be the very last time he would see his daughter. Deanna got on her plane and headed to Arizona. Deanna would call her parents the next day from her hotel from Flagstaff, Arizona. Flagstaff is the nearest city to the Grand Canyon and a common destination for tourists looking for a place to stay. She told them how excited she was to see the canyon and that she would be going there first thing in the morning. She told her parents that she would keep them updated as she documented her adventures. Deanna would update her Facebook profile picture the very next day to be a picture that seemed to show her smiling at the edge of the canyon. She would go on to take a tour of the canyon the next day and visited all the places that she had wanted to see. Her plans to do a solo trip went out the window when she saw the sheer size of the canyon. She knew a lot about the Grand Canyon and had done months of research, but she felt the task was too large for her to take on. Deanna was just happy to take a guided tour of the canyon than she would have been if she had done it herself. Everything seemed to be going perfectly. Deanna called her parents a few days later, told them about her amazing experience of the canyon. She told them that she was gonna go hiking the next day before she headed back to the airport. Her parents reminded her that her flight was gonna leave at 5.30 p.m. and that she needed to leave with plenty of time to spare. But Deanna assured her parents that she would only be at the canyon during the morning and would have plenty of time to make her flight. She reassured her parents that everything would be all right and hung up the phone. This would be the last contact that Deanna ever had with her parents. What happened next to Deanna is a mystery. She simply never returned home and only sent one text to her parents before her disappearance. When they asked her if she was on the way to the airport, she simply responded, no, I am not going, with no explanation. Deanna's parents checked her credit card transactions and found that the last purchase made with her card was for the shuttle to the Grand Canyon and the purchase of a t-shirt in a gift shop nearby. When the family lost contact with their daughter, they called the local police and filed a missing persons report. Authorities searched for several weeks to find Deanna, but she was never found, and there was no trace of her ever seen again. The missing person's case of Deanna is still an active case to this day. The parents are still hoping to find some sort of evidence that could lead to the discovery of their daughter. This heartbreaking story is yet another example of how easy it is to get lost in the vastness of the Grand Canyon. Search attempts often end in failure because of the sheer size of the canyon. If you ever decide to take a trip to see one of the most amazing natural land formations in the U.S., please proceed with caution and do not travel alone. There are too many horror stories like this one that we have discussed today to be traveling by yourself. The canyon is unique for the sheer quantity of active missing persons cases in the area, and it appears to be a hotbed for disappearances, and they do not seem to be stopping anytime soon. If you have any information regarding some of the more recent cases we discussed today, please 
notify the proper authorities. Many of the families would be grateful to finally have some closure. If you have had any strange experiences with the Grand Canyon or similar areas, feel free to write them in the comments or send them to me at stories at whatlooksbeneath.com. I'm sure there are many more people out there with experiences regarding missing persons and the Grand Canyon. If you enjoyed tonight's video, be sure to go ahead and slap that like button and leave a comment down below. Also, if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button and keep your notifications on so that way YouTube will let you know every time I release a great new video. As always guys, stay safe and I'll see you all in the very next video.